the Tricks of the Trade, the podcast series where you can learn from the best in the business. I'm your host, Rabani from Curate, which is an IIM alumni venture and India's first revenue tech firm, where we enable leading startups and corporations to maximize their revenue potential by building the best revenue teams. Now, in these series, we invite industry experts such as yourself to share your mm-hmm you know, practical tips, insights, and secrets of success. Whether you're an employee, a student, or a lifelong learner, you will always find something valuable and interesting in every episode. Now, today we have a very special guest with us, Amir Sayyad. Amir Ahmed Sayyad, an Associate Director of Sales at Darwin Box, a renowned cloud-based human capital management platform with over six years of experience in sales, business development, customer success, and marketing. Amir has traversed various domains, including supply chain, education, and software. Holding an MBA from the prestigious Babson College in Boston, Amir, welcome to the show and thank you for joining us today. So can you brief us about your education and professional journey? Yeah. So um, I think I, uh, my, my journey in education is something that a lot of folks from India especially would resonate with. Right. Okay. I, I finished schooling and immediately went for my undergrad. I did an, I have an engineering degree as my undergrad. Right. Um, right. I had initially thought that I'd be say <laughs> designing cars for a living. But I think during the course of my undergrad, I realized that my strengths and interests were more aligned with uh, interacting with people right. and also having a past in uh, in doing a lot of debating and public speaking. I think the whole profession of sales is something that came in very, very naturally to me. Right. Right. So I took a conscious decision that the moment my undergrad finishes, I'll go ahead and take up a role in sales. Right focusing on customer interaction, etc. Right. Um, so did sales for a couple of years post that mm-hmm. uh, after say about four years of working uh, in sales roles across organizations, uh, mm-hmm. I decided to do an MBA. Right. So uh, I ultimately got into Babson College after giving my GMAT going through the whole, you know, rounds of applications uh, and I decided to go to Boston. Uh, at Babson College for my MBA. So Babson is currently the number one campus in the world when it comes to entrepreneurship based MBA, right? Babson focuses on something called as ETNA, which is entrepreneurial thought and action. Mm. And uh, that's that's something which is at the core of whatever we do at Babson. And, and that really attracted me to the course, the campus. So um, I did the full two year MBA program at Babson. Okay. And, and yeah, post that I went back to sales, which is where my interest lies. Right. So uh, uh, speaking about your background as such, since you said mm-hmm. you are from engineering, right? And then right. we were going to say like design cars and all of that. So why? What right. was, what inspired you to pursue a career in sales? So it's it's interesting, right? So if you when I when I was in high school, I got introduced to competitive debating. Right. right, one or two times is fun. You do it for co-curricular. Then I started getting this thrill out of, say, convincing somebody on something or changing somebody's opinion or mindset. Right, and I really started to get a kick out of it. Right. So um, I think there are two professions that really adhere to this. One is law, and the other is sales. Right, sales was more of my calling. Uh, so I I went ahead with that. Right. So, uh, in your current role, what what does your mm-hmm. day look like in in Darwin Box? So, if you should talk about a typical day, the 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 life of a salesperson, mm-hmm. right, is like there's a lot happening. There are accounts that are at different stages that you want to nurture. So the the day starts with planning. I would say ten percent of my activity is planning. Right, okay. I'm very met- methodical in my approach. Like I use a tool called Trello which is a project tracking tool. So I put all my deals over there. I I try and see what I need to work on today. Uh, That's 10% of my day. Uh, 60% from there is actually client facing, right? Whether it's uh, whether you're introducing yourself, pitching, Mm -hmm. uh, you're doing a product demonstration, you're following up, you're giving a reassurance. 60% is actually interacting with the client, Mm -hmm. whether it is in person, whether it is on phone depends on you know, how your current business uh, is going on and how bad the pandemic is in the world. Uh, The remainder 30% uh, would be 20% of that would be uh, deal structuring. 
right. right so when you're in sales uh the the proposal that you make and how you structure a deal has a huge impact on um, you know how your client receives that so a lot of my day goes about how you want to show a particular pricing how you want that to be worded what should the proposal look like right, right? it's very easy right? every organization will have a sales deck and it's very easy to copy paste slides from there but it's important to understand what is that so what is the right slide to put in what is the metric or what's the value that the customer is looking for before they actually see the price point at which your product or solution is coming in so that is 20 percent of my day and 10 percent of course is outreach and upkeep right you reach out to new people to, to network with you you reach out to your existing clients um, to touch base with them to keep track of where your project is and if you have any existing accounts you you touch base with them to see if there are any other opportunities that are lying with them right so that's quite yeah. a productive day that you have there <laughs> right so coming on to the questions as well so with your extensive uh -huh. experience in sales right mm -hmm. across different domains what strategies or approaches have you found to be the most effective in nurturing relationships with customers and promoting ideas to them so in my opinion sales uh, is a trust driven process right yes. uh, and the way i look at it trust can be achieved through a simple two step process right which is yes. merit followed by transparency now the merit is in how well you can solve a problem for a customer right now you can you can drill deep into it like you can do extensive sessions on understanding the problems then you can create a solution for them once you understand it right. uh, merit is when you make the customer realize that there is value to what you're saying mm -hmm. and if you if you're working with a product or a services company whatever you have to offer is somewhere a part of that solution right right it could be the entire solution it could be a part of that solution you now that's that's how you cleverly put it that's establishing your merit the moment there is merit the moment the customer understands that yes this particular person is able to solve my problem okay. uh, that's when you move on to the next step which is from there you be transparent with them right if your product is solving 60% of the problem let's be clear about it yeah right so that establishes that trust so whether it is in terms of pricing whether it is in terms of timeline whether it is in terms of delivery if you're transparent after establishing your value that really helps build trust and and make sure that you go through uh, the entire process of the deal with your client and and that keeps them from looking around for alternatives right so is there any specific approach like for example say consultative approach that you mm -hmm. use to you know sort of like deal with your clients as well consultative selling is the way to go right yes. uh, especially if you talk about b2b businesses Mm -hmm. consultative selling is the way to go however there is no cookie cutter approach that you can follow right. right the way the way i look at it i feel that it is very important to do a very strong discovery call right in the beginning what mm -hmm. that means is to clearly understand what the problem is right, right. Uh, in sales a lot of people have this problem which uh, we call as happy ears you hear one or two keywords that you are used to hearing and the immediate thought in our minds is that okay that uh, i heard the keyword now i'm going to start selling my product right. right so we need to stay away from happy ears you do a solid discovery you understand first what the client is asking for mm -hmm. i think that uh, is how i like to begin with the process right and so sales is often seen mm -hmm. as a competitive field so how do you mm -hmm. balance the need for healthy competition while also fostering a collaborative environment within your sales team mm -hmm. Uh, so in sales firstly the the atmosphere internally has to be healthy right so one if one effective way of doing that is doing a proper segregation of accounts right now there are some organizations that separate accounts on the basis of territory some on the basis of headcount some on the basis of uh, i don't know if you're mining leads some people do alphabetically whatever the reason is i think a very clear segregation of accounts per rep is very very important right. right that ensures that when you go to the other person for advice they're not going to snoop in and take away your account right, right. so once once that surety is there within the team uh, it's it's very easy to go to the other person for advice 
Right. Secondly, there's one thing with, uh, that we do within our firm, which has been very helpful, is that we keep sessions around uh, to discuss certain best practices. Right? For those people who are in a product company, it's very important to stay abreast with what latest updates your product is coming with. Right? It, it does many favors. It keeps you updated on the product. You, you have something additional to talk to your clients rather than doing just a simple follow up to touch base. You have an additional update to talk about. And in these sessions uh, at Darwin Box, we also talk about certain best practices that have been working for us. Right. right. So, so doing these sort of sessions uh, can really help create a healthy competitive environment within the sales team. That is great. And mm -hmm. so as technology continues to evolve, right? So how have mm -hmm. you adapted your sales strategies to leverage, say, tools such as data analysis, SEO, and social mm -hmm. media marketing? See, social media is bread and butter yeah, for any mm -hmm. kind of sales that you do, right? Uh, I was just telling my friends the other day that if you go to my screen time on my phone, probably LinkedIn takes up more time than Instagram or Facebook nowadays, right? So, but then you need to use each sort of social media very, very carefully for what kind of, uh, for kind of outreach that you're doing, right? A lot of businesses uh, that that thrive on, uh, say, content or thought leadership, they can, they use Twitter very, very judiciously, right? LinkedIn, of course, is the primary go-to place for outreach uh, and connecting with not just your uh, prospects, but say your existing customers as well. Um, not exactly social media, but WhatsApp is a very, very powerful tool that people should leverage, right? WhatsApp is not just for your regular communication. It's a great informal way to send an update to uh, a target audience whom you don't want to clutter their inbox with emails, right? right? So uh, like I use, I use WhatsApp, uh, very extensively right it, it's very easy to to make a small creative on your own on powerpoint or canva and just directly copy paste it on a whatsapp chat right. uh, seo is great for businesses that thrive on inbound traffic right it's an exercise that everybody must do uh, in most organizations the marketing team can help you with any seo related assistance that you want and it's right. a good exercise it really helps the organization understand you know what are certain keywords etc that are more important to them than the others right yeah. uh, i wouldn't be an expert to talk about seo uh, mm -hmm. but i have worked in startups that benefited from an uh, from an seo optimization project that they did right. what i would really like to highlight and which is really hot right now mm -hmm. is leveraging uh, ai right, right? Uh, like chat gpt is all the rage right now mm -hmm. and uh, rightfully said chat gpt can really really help you save a lot of time and effort right. right for anybody who's smart enough to leverage it right i'll give you an example for people that are in sales that do a lot of outreach that mm -hmm. do a lot of uh, email marketing right right now you don't have to create content from scratch you can literally go to chat gpt and ask them to create a sales outreach yeah. email for an xyz product and and you can get a good draft now most people leave chat gpt at this point that whatever they have they copy paste it mm. and then make edits themselves a lot of people still don't know that in chat gpt once you receive a prompt you can give it feedback to redo it for right. example once i've received the template i can ask chat gpt to make it that hey, hey please make this less formal and restrict the output to 200 words or less right so it understands context and it will recreate the same thing for you so this is something which teams should really leverage on right and people who are in inside sales who do mass emailing campaigns mm -hmm. it saves them a lot of time and effort for sales folks you can you can create two or three templates for follow up emails now using chat gpt saving you time and effort right this is my latest find and i'm very excited about it <laughs> right, right. That is great. So, anything yeah. apart from Jack Chat GPT, any instance that you can name of where you know we were using mm -hmm. these tools and they help you grow your businesses and deliver value to your customers as well. I mean, I'm a college student at heart, right? So, the tools that we used for all our projects in college mm -hmm. are enough 
to help you with any sort of sales related uh, outreach or campaigns that you're doing right what are the what are the uh, softwares that we use during college we use canva to create any sort of graphics right uh, we use a lot of trello at babson to manage our projects right, right? so what what i often do is that depending on the type of outreach uh, that i'm trying to create i'll create graphics using canva my, myself slap on the company logo there if that's permissible for you that's even great right. and because nobody knows your audience more than you and sometimes you don't need a mass emailer i once created a content just about giving certain quarter end prices and sent it to a bunch of clients that i wanted to reconnect with and you won't believe two of them actually came back to me with that right just because the graphic that i found on canva was eye catching right right so that so that eye catching graphic that you want to send out doesn't necessarily have to be a campaign that is released by marketing approved by your cmo right personal initiative the good old elbow grease can also help you with those things right that is great yeah. and so building strong customer relationships is crucial for long term success in sales mm -hmm. so what are some of your key principles or practices that you follow to establish and maintain these relationships throughout the sales process uh, as i said you know the sales process is very trust based so yeah. it's important for anybody to be genuine mm -hmm. right today if anybody is trying to fake anything to build a rapport or maintain a relationship people can smell that from a mile away right. right so you be genuine if you if you actually like something or have a common interest with the client only then do you share that right, right. not trying to find fake connections i know a lot of people uh, no ill intentions, but try to find whatever commonality they can between them and a prospect on LinkedIn and yeah. try to harp on that. But people can tell how, how forced or far-fetched that is. So right. firstly, let's try, let's all try and be genuine. Mm -hmm. And for these relationships, I think confirmations and reassurances go hand in hand. Right. For my clients, I always give them confirmations along each and every step of the sales process mm -hmm. of what is done. For example, if i need to get if i need to create a proposal right? right so if the annual sorry if the average time taken for a proposal to get approved say is 48 hours mm -hmm. so the moment i finish my proposal i would update my client right. that hey the proposal has been completed and it has been sent to senior management for approval mm -hmm. right so the, that's a confirmation that you're giving to the client that the work is happening in the background right. then if the proposal is not received the next day you reassure them that hey, I told you you're gonna get it by Tuesday. It's yes. 10 a.m. Uh, you'll definitely get it by EOD. So that's a that's a series of confirmations and reassurances that you can give that can really help you build these long-term relationships. Of course, everything that I'm and that I'm saying right now mm -hmm. is intertwined with the fact that you start the relationship by building trust with the client. Right. Right. And then you do all this to make sure that it's a long-term relationship. Right. And in, in your experience, what are some of the common challenges mm. that sales professionals face? And how do you approach, mm. uh, you know, how to overcome them? Okay. So yeah. for a salesperson, uh, I think the way I look at it, prioritization or the lack of it can be a huge challenge, right? It's very easy to get overwhelmed right. if you have a lot of accounts coming your way. Right. There are people, a, a good example is that, say, your organization ran a marketing campaign mm -hmm. that was successful and you got tons of leads from that campaign. Now, right. sales is a time sensitive role, which means that when the lead is hot, you have to act on it. Right. But if the volume becomes high, it's important to prioritize. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you want to work on 10 simultaneous projects which are of a lesser value? Right. Or would you want to work on four larger projects, but nurture them really well, mm -hmm. right? Easier said than done, but this prioritization is something that people should be doing very, very carefully right. too, so that their, their time, uh, effort, resources are put in the right way, yeah. right? Uh, I've been talking about Trello, so I use that extensively to understand which project is at what stage. Right. Another tool that a lot of people can use is a simple Eisenhower matrix. Right. And Eisenhower matrix is a simple two by two matrix that helps you understand or that helps you uh, define 
what task for that particular day is urgent versus important right, right. it's a very very basic it's a step zero procedure but sometimes it gives you clarity on how you want to proceed with your day right one thing that people should be aware of is the sunk cost fallacy right sunk cost fallacy is a decision making trap mm -hmm. where we tend to nurture a project even when it's dead just because we put in a lot of effort in it earlier right? Right. it's a very common decision making mistake you mm -hmm. spend 6 months on a project uh, right. But the project is giving you no returns. Right? It's difficult sometimes for people to sever that arm. Mm -hmm. right? You you want to keep nurturing it, thinking that I'll give it one more month, maybe it'll give results. Right. But sometimes you have to take that hard call. So that sunk cost fallacy is something that people should uh, be very, very aware of. Then there is something called as the confirming evidence trap. Right? Sometimes we tend to lean towards evidences that support our mindset and move away from an evidence that that actually denies it for example say there is a deal that a salesperson is working on mm -hmm. now your project champion mm -hmm. is giving you hints that yes this project might work and you're picking up on that but in your last interaction with the decision maker you did not get a good hint or you or the, you know you picked up on signs that this deal is not working out mm -hmm. now a lot of people tend to ignore the fact that the senior management is not convinced and end up spending their time and effort only pushing their primary spot. Right. right. So this is a confirmation confirming evidence trap which people should stay away from. It's very, very important. And lastly, the biggest, the mother of all challenges that a salesperson should stay away from is burnout. So keep taking your breaks, right? Don't don't store your leaves so that you can encash them later, right. but make sure that once in a quarter, at least you go out on a vacation, you blow off some steam. Right, that, that's great advice. Right. 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 Had I taken my advice, maybe it didn't have as many grades as I do right now. <laughs> <laughs> right, so as an MBA graduate from Parkinson College, you likely mm -hmm. gained you know, valuable insights into leadership and business development. So how have these mm -hmm. learnings influenced your approach to sales? And what advice would you give to aspiring sales professionals looking to advance their careers? So I, I'll go ahead with uh, what I said about Babson. Right? It's ETNA all the way. So right. entrepreneurial thought and action. Think that you don't have any resources you have a bootstrap startup that you want to run it's your venture it's your baby it's your responsibility and you are your only assistance the moment you have imbibed this it's so much easier for you to actually develop a particular business now and this can be used in multiple scenarios whether you are new in sales and you want to pursue a particular prospect don't count on your marketing team to send you those email templates that have worked for you in the past. Those are a good to have, but don't waste crucial time in waiting for those to come in. Right? Mm -hmm. Start the outreach on your own. Right. One thing that Babson really taught me is that people are like people are receptive uh, when you reach out to them um, and you ask for advice. Right? A lot of times people. Mm -hmm. Uh, feel that okay if i'm reaching out to a cxo mm -hmm. on what they have to think they may not respond they may not entertain but more often than not people who are in leadership positions mm -hmm. they they respond to your outreach right uh, the thing is that there should be merit in what you're saying right i always make sure that my linkedin messages are never about hey would just love to be a part of your network mm -hmm. right there is a there's a term in sales called wifi which means what's in it for you so okay. whenever I reach out to anybody, I make sure that they know that what's in it for them if they take out five minutes to speak with me. And the moment you do that with confidence okay. and knowing that you're making sense, the hit rate goes really high. And that that also establishes a lot of credibility for you as a salesperson in the eyes of the senior stakeholder. Right. That is some great advice. And so coming on to uh, any, any, do you have any memorable sales success story when your efforts made a mm -hmm. significant impact on both the customer and the company? And what were the key factors that contributed to this success? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, there is, uh, 
there's this one account I remember. It's a story about pure elbow grease, right? Of how sometimes pushing for things works in your favor. So there was a manufacturing slash automobile sort of client in the remote parts of North India. Mm -hmm. And that was a deal nobody really wanted to pick up. Right? The, uh, the client was not very, very approachable. They were far away. And uh, because of the pandemic, of course, we were facing problems in meeting up anyway. But I was new in the firm and I realized that I got nothing to lose if I if I just go and meet them for a day. Right. And of course, I told you my approach has always been to do a very, very strong discovery in the beginning and mm -hmm. establish your value right there. Right. So I went on that three hour drive to their office. I sat down with them. We did a half day meeting. Mm -hmm. They were kind enough to, to offer me lunch at their factory itself. Right. So got to bond with the entire team. Great meeting, a lot of effort went into the demonstration. That meeting did not turn into a deal. Right. I was disappointed, but I was ready for that. Right. But the impact that was made, the impact that I could create in that meeting, they saw somebody took out time, drove all the way, spent half a day with them, didn't immediately start pitching, right? First understood the problem, then offered the solution, mm -hmm. then showed where his product actually worked, right? So that I think really stuck with him. Three months later, the same firm called me back mm -hmm. saying that we're interested to have that conversation again. But this time it was with their head office. So the size of the deal went almost two and a half times from what it actually started with. And I think and I think this this purely happened because that one day I decided that, OK, I will go the extra mile and meet them and right. not try and enter in this over a phone call. Right. So. The moral of the story, even though it's a very, very simple one, is that if you're yeah. in sales, then never stop hustling. Right. Right. It's hustling that gets you far. Right. So yeah. this is a very, very simple story, but very close to my heart because <laughs> that one drive that spending half a day with the client really turned things around. Right. That is great. And so speaking about successes as well, so mm -hmm. uh, I believe in, in sales, there are rejections as well, right? So how do you mm -hmm. deal with those projections? Well, a strong pipeline really helps you handle a rejection. Right. Right. So if everything is count is if you know that your entire target, your entire quota, your performance is dependent on that one particular deal, it's right. going to break your heart. Right. It's going to be the worst X of your life. Right. But the moment you have a strong pipeline, you know that yes it's disheartening but it's not heartbreaking right and you know that there are four other deals in your pipeline that you can count on right. so that for me really helps me with rejection also sometimes trying to understand mm -hmm. that the the success or failure of a deal is not dependent on the efforts of the representative of the person who's running that deal right there are so many external factors that come in right? you might be doing the best of sales meetings, pitches, demonstrations. But the, if the priority of the organization changes, then there is nothing that you can do to change the outcome of that deal in that instant. Hmm. So you like anybody who is in sales should be able to detach themselves from the deal. I know easier said than done. It's so it's so easy to feel dejected when the deal fails, hmm. but you have to understand that uh, it's bigger than you it's not just entirely revolving around you and if you have a great pipeline it's not going to sting as much right right that is great and so with the pandemic as well so mm -hmm. the pandemic has brought mm -hmm. about significant changes in the way businesses operate right so how has mm -hmm. the sales landscape evolved and what adjustments have you made to adapt to these changes I think the biggest adjustment every business made was that, you know, we all switched over to virtual calls very, very easily, right? right? What you and I are also doing right now. Right. So we switched to our Google Meets and Zooms of the world very, very quickly. But I think one thing that a lot of people are not doing is humanizing that act. Right. That today, if you're doing a business meeting with a team, I strongly advise everybody to turn on their cameras. Right. Right. That humanizes the act. You know that you're talking to a person. Right. Um, also, the impact is is very, very different when you actually see the person. 
right? You can read the tones. You can see how they're responding. You can do a lot of course correction, right? I have done this. I have done course correction when I know that, okay, the expression of my client is changing. Maybe I should talk about something else, right? right? Or sometimes I felt so great after a meeting because I could clearly see that they were smiling throughout. That means whatever I was trying to pitch, that was working, right? So use your virtual meetings to your advantage. Turn on your camera. Look sharp for a meeting. Don't look shabby. Right. Uh, sales revolves a lot around presentation. So when you're going for client meetings, uh, even if it's virtual, make sure you're dressed up appropriately for it. It makes a huge impact. It makes uh, a doubly huge impact in case you're interacting with somebody for the first time. Right. right. People tend to get too comfortable sometimes at home, but not if you're on a sales call. Mm -hmm. So that's very, very important. Right. Uh, in the same spirit, I found this new technology. I mean, it's not new technology, it's NFC. These are virtual business cards, right? right? Where you can just tap your phone and you can share your contact details with somebody. Mm -hmm. So uh, things have gotten a lot better now in terms of how the pandemic is affecting business. Right, a lot of businesses are back open as usual. However, should we ever come to a situation where we're back to, you know, uh, restricting contact, this is a great way to share your contact details. Right. Um, using these virtual business cards, and the moment you Google it, it's very easy to find NFC enabled business cards. Small tech, small investments, huge turnaround for any for wherever you meet a person. Right. Right. And uh, lastly, I think in a world that's becoming more and more virtual if you're not meeting your meeting your clients or your target audience make sure you put an extra effort to build that rapport make that one extra call do that one call which is not so much about work or update right mm -hmm. humanize that situation if right. you have a genuine shared interest talk about it mm -hmm. right cricket is is the biggest religion in the country if you and your client share that interest, please talk about it. Doesn't always have to be work. It's these small things that make you look like a normal person and not a textbook salesperson for the client. Right. Yeah. So these are these are things that I keep in mind. Right. So that is some great advice as well. So sales mm -hmm. can also be a very high in pressure, right? With targets and quotas. Mm -hmm. So how do you maintain and keep your sales team engaged during these challenging times? Well, I can I can talk for myself over here, right? What I propagate is that if you have high targets, uh, or, and depending on, let's say, a lot of people have an annual target, mm -hmm. it's extremely important that you make a calendar and you break those targets down, right? Make the first half of your target calendar more heavy than the second half. Right. Uh, make sure that you plan how you're going to achieve it. Backtrack the numbers, right? There is always a funnel in sales. Right. So, so do a reverse funnel calculation that to reach X amount of revenue, how many deals would you require, right? What's your conversion ratio for a deal? Right. Uh, and then backtrack. That's very, very important. And for anybody, let's say, who's do, who has an annual uh, sales quota, mm. they should do these reverse calculations on a quarterly and a monthly basis. Right. Just to get an idea. Sometimes you realize that okay, uh, I need to I need to take up say four to four to five week four to five deals in a week. Mm -hmm. After the first level of discovery, maybe I will lose one account. So that'll be four that go into demo stage. There right. are a lot of organizations that are just fishing. So out of these four, I might just lose I might lose two, and there are only two that I'll nurture. And then these two are the ones that will go to a commercial or a negotiation stage. Mm -hmm. And out of these two, maybe only one closes. Right. So if in a month I see that only one deal closes, then maybe I should increase or look at deals that have a larger ticket size. Right. Right? That's the kind of calculation one should do mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, that they're planning their target achievement properly right. and not taking pressure about meeting targets towards the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, I read this at a gym somewhere that if you ever feel like quitting, remember why you started. Mm -hmm. So this is something that your sales team should also have in mind, right? If you ever feel like, okay, why am I doing this? Remember that you've put in a lot of effort. You're so close to meeting, meeting your quota, 
So go that particular extra mile, you know. Uh, do that three-hour drive if it's required. If you think it's going to turn things around, uh, that really really helps. And to keep yourself motivated, because uh, sales might be an incentive-driven profession, definitely, but there is nothing that impacts you more than self incentivization if you yourself are not internally motivated there is no other incentive in the world that can change your mind right. and the reverse of it is also true so you need to be the one to motivate yourself and find purpose in what you're doing right. and uh, as i had said earlier it's so easy to feel overwhelmed to feel burnt out so right. always have something that you know that you enjoy and helps you blow off steam, right? You go out, you meet with friends, you do an outdoor activity, you pursue a hobby. Um, I, I play music, right? So uh, that really helps me uh, blow off some steam. So every time I have, uh, say I feel over overwhelmed, I go take out my guitar, I play for some time, makes me feel good, and then I come back to work. If, there are, if the type of business that you're associated with if that permits, try and shut off over the weekend. In one of my jobs, I had a personal phone and a work phone. Right. So I, so at that point in my career, I could afford to afford to turn off my work phone over the weekend. Right. See if you can do that. It really helps you disconnect. It helps you recharge, mm -hmm. and it gives you, uh, you know, strength to go on for the coming week. Right. Right. That is that yeah. was very insightful. So that was the last question from my end, Amir. It was great to mm -hmm. have you on board with us. And thank you for asking. Uh, thank you for answering all of our questions. Absolutely. My pleasure to be on board. Thank you for having me over. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to help any other way that I can. I hope I hope everything that I said makes sense. These are all things that I picked up from experience right. and talking to people who are in the industry as experts. If anybody is able to benefit from anything that I said, I'd be more than happy. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you so much for coming on board with us. Thank you. My absolute pleasure. Take Have care. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. You too. Bye.